Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The appointment of permanent executive leadership at Transnet was a major development this week. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the implications. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Reaction to the appointment have be, has been broadly positive. Yes, that's correct. You know, <coughs> the, the situation at Transnet has been quite dire over the last number of years. They've lost a lot of business mostly to road on the, from the rail side. There's been a lot of crime and criminality around uh, the infrastructure, a lot of cable theft. And there's also been uh, unhappiness, I think, from certain clients. You know, the mining, the mining industry accounts for something like 80% of the Transnet freight rail revenues. And over the last few years have been raising serious issues with the leadership at Transnet. And there was a major change last year with a number of resignations. And then, you know, we've had this tradition now that's built up. We're appointing permanent replacements uh, at state-owned companies takes forever. So this has been a fairly rapid turnaround. Um, and we've now got Michelle Phillips as the new CEO. And I think here yeah, the reaction from business is because they've been working with Michelle since uh, for the past, since about August last year, September. And they've got to know that she's pushing ahead uh, with a number of the issues that are starting to unblock the problems that are, are in the way of, you know, getting the volumes restored, getting some of the cargoes, the, the rail-friendly cargoes back to rail, as well as, you know, dealing with the massive port problems that they've had over the last few years. So I think that's really, that's the, the speed at which this decision was made. It's not, it's not <laughs> anything to write home about, but, but relative to what we got used to at, say, Eskom where it takes forever to, to get a replacement. I think that's been welcomed, as well as I think there's a, a knowledge that this is someone who has deep experience of Transnet, has been at the business for 20 years, but also has a very open, I think, relationship with the customers and an openness to the reforms that are needed to turn the business around. There are signs that the turnaround and reforms are starting to show results. Yes, it's very early days, <coughs> and, but uh, I think the mining industry, the Mineral Council calls it green shoots. Um, but it is early days. It's really from a very low base. And we know what's happening on our roads. We know what's happening on certain corridors where trucks have basically taken over uh, those roads, taking um, manganese or chrome across the border into Mozambique, having to take coal trucks instead of coal trains down to Richards Bay. It's really been devastating for certain towns, certain communities, it's made the roads really unsafe. So that's that anything to start pushing that back is, is important. We're not really seeing anything there yet. But on the ports front, you know, the, there was a massive backlog that developed last year, towards the end of last year, around the container terminals in particular. Uh, Cape Town had a massive backlog, but in particular, but especially uh, the Durban Container Terminal, which is South Africa's largest. It's the lifeblood in many ways of the economy, you know, for trade, um, for the non-commodity aspects of the economy. So we get all our goods and s goods coming through there and we export our manufactured goods down through there. So it's a very important corridor and that was totally snarled up with many, many ships at anchor, at anchor and not able to access the terminal. And there's definitely been a clearing of that backlog um, it's taken months, but it, there's definitely signs that things are starting to turn around uh, at the ports. A long way to go, as I said earlier. Also, I think we're seeing signs of the collaboration between business and Transnet through this Transnet Recovery Plan, the National Logistics Crisis Committee that was set up by the presidency last year. We're starting to see some real uh, action there on a policy level. So we've seen the National Logist the Freight Logistics, the roadmap approved by Cabinet. The public sector participation framework has been approved by Cabinet. Uh, so those are major sort of policy overlays that are going to open up the rail network to third party access. But then on a very practical level too, we've seen a spare parts deal that's been entered into between customers and Transnet and then this week Transnet Freight Rail signed uh, an important deal with Sassel that uh, has 128 ammonia tankers sort of that are going to be financed. The, ma the, the return to service and maintenance is going to be financed, it seems, by Sassel. This is a dedicated fleet between Sasselberg 
uh, and Secunda and mostly into Gauteng. We know that we've got big businesses like uh, AECR that, re that require ammonia to produce their chemicals for the mining industry and the explosives. And that, that's been a major constraint. And we've seen that fleet of 128 falling. I think AECR was saying it was down to the sort of 60 type level. It was, it was a really dramatic uh, problem. So that will hopefully secure supply. But it's not enough for some of these businesses. They've seen the disruption. So they, they're going to continue looking elsewhere to source the ammonia. But uh, AECI says this should sort of provide them with some security of supply. And I suppose whoever else uses this ammonia in, in, in the Gauteng province. So these are practical examples where the collaboration between the private sector and Transnet Freight Rail in this instance are starting to turn that business around. So definitely there are signs and green shoots of recovery but as I mentioned right at the start, it's early days. When are these developments likely to start having a positive impact on volumes and the economy? I think that's the next big step. <clears throat> and I think a lot of it's going to hinge on the rail side on third party access. So there's a, a vertical separation currently happening within Transnet Freight Rail between the infrastructure business or the infrastructure manager that manages the, the lines itself and the, operate, the train operating business. And the train operating business, a bit like what we've seen on the electricity front, is going to be in a competitive situation. So in electricity, you see you've got RPPs coming into the system and using the grid uh, network. Similarly, on rail, we're going to start seeing private train operators starting to enter the system. Now, the, the devil's always in the details, and it takes time to do these concessionings. But I think that's going to be an important next step to see how that sort of evolves and whether it starts capturing that rail friendly traffic back to the railways. At the moment, a lot of rail friendly traffic is on the road. I mentioned a lot of those, those products like um, uh, manganese and, and chrome that are going out through Mozambique and the coal that's going to Richards Bay on, on track. That's, that's really not ideal at all. It raises the cost. It's an environmental hazard and it's a big safety hazard for all of us on the road, road users and pedestrians. So those, especially the rail friendly traffic needs to be recaptured. Uh, I think in many ways the horse has bolted in terms of road to rail and road's going to be the mainstay, especially of the container traffic. I can't see rail being extremely competitive in, in, the, sh in the short term at least. I think we're going to still see a lot of road traffic around the other, the general freight. But I think on the, 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 mining, the mining type commodities, it's going to be important to start seeing that. Now, when will we see that f filtering through? I think there's still some months to go before we can get start seeing the concessioning, start seeing the, the, the benefits of the pri public, private partnerships like the Cecil, um, the Cecil partnership and maybe others to come, I'm sure others to come. Those, will, those are sort of low-hanging fruit ones where there's almost dedicated lanes and dedicated fleets. But on a more general generalised, it's going to be about a bidding process and getting access to the rail. And then on the port side, you know, there's this concession or of the container terminal down in Durban still hasn't reached financial close. I think there's a lot of questions what is going on there. But that as well, we should see more private port terminal operators coming in. Already there are a lot of private port terminal operators um, uh, that compete with TPT or complement TPT, which is the state-owned transnet operator. So a bit like what we've seen in the ports with more and more private operators around TPT, uh, we'll see eventually on rail, where we'll see train operating companies operating in parallel, hopefully complementing, uh, but also competing with uh, transnet freight rails, train operating business and hopefully with the infrastructure manager uh, running it in a level, uh, with a level play, playing field mentality and not favouring the in-house company over these competitors. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.